morning, and welcome everyone to the second day of our meeting. Today is February 23rd, and I'm pleased to call our ACIP meeting to order. Um, I will now take roll call for the members only. Um, and I, do we have any votes today, Dr. No. Wharton? We don't, so no conflicts of interest need to be stated today? Or should we state conflicts again? Why don't again? you state them anyway? Okay, we'll state conflicts again. Um, I'll just go around the um, virtual room first, and then we'll um, go into the physical room. So, uh, Dr. Bell. Uh, Beth Bell, clinical professor, Department of Global Health, University of Washington, no conflicts. Thank you. Um, Dr. Brooks? We'll come back. Uh, let's see, Dr. Daly. Uh, Matt Daly, um, Senior Investigator, Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, no conflicts of interest, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Jamie Lair, owner, private practice, family medicine in Ithaca, New York, no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Wilbur Chen, uh, Professor of Medicine, Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Good morning, Kip Talbot, adult infectious disease doctor, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, no conflicts. Thank you, um, Grace Lee. Stanford University School of Medicine <laughs> and no conflicts. Dr. Paling. Kathy Paling, Professor of Pediatrics and Epidemiology and Prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine, Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist. I have no conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sineas. Sybil Sineas. I'm an internist and pediatrician, Associate Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics at Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Cotton. Uh, Camille Cotton, I'm the Clinical Director of Transplant and Immunocompromised Host Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital um, and Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. I do have a conflict of interest in that I am involved in a clinical trial for a Takeda investigational um, antiviral agent for cytomegalovirus. This does not in any way involve vaccine work. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Long? Good morning, I'm Sarah Long. I'm a professor of pediatrics and infectious diseases at Drexel University College of Medicine. I have no conflict. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Good morning, Pablo Sanchez. I'm a professor of pediatrics, neonatology, and pediatric infectious diseases at The Ohio State University and Nationwide Children's Hospital. I have no conflict, thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNally. Good morning, Veronica McNally, president of the Franny Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Oliver Brooks, acting CEO, chief medical officer, Watts Healthcare Corporation, Los Angeles, California. I have no conflicts, good morning. Good morning and thank you. And um, we, we are at quorum, so we should be able to proceed with today's meeting. Um, next, we'll move on to agency updates, and we'll um, start the day by uh, inviting Dr. Romero uh, to provide his agency update on behalf of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. So during the upcoming ACIP uh, sessions, you will hear the most current information on many of CDC's efforts. Because of this, I will keep my CDC update brief and limit it to comments on updates on polio, measles, and childhood vaccination coverage. So as many of you know, a case of, po of paralytic poliomyelitis was confirmed in an unvaccinated person in Rockland County, New York, on July 21st, 2022. Shortly thereafter, CDC deployed staff to New York's Rockland and Orange Counties to assist with the investigation and vaccination efforts. CDC continues to support these efforts. CDC is also partnering with select jurisdictions on plans to expand wastewater testing where communities are at risk for poliovirus transmission. It is encouraging to note that for more than seven months, no new paralytic poliomyelitis cases uh, have been identified in the United States, and the last poliovirus detection was in December of last year. Moving on to measles. Provisional data indicate that there were 100 and 21 cases of measles in the United States in 2022. As of January 27th of this year, there have been two cases 
in two U.S. jurisdictions. Earlier this month, in Ohio, the Columbus Public Health uh, uh, de uh, Department declared measles outbreak over after 85 cases were uh, identified. As a reminder, a measles outbreak is declared over when two incubation periods, 42 days, have passed without another case. Jurisdictions at highest risk for measles continue to be those communities with persistently low vaccination coverage and a risk for importations from locations outside the United States where measles is endemic or experiencing uh, outbreaks. Uh, turning on now to uh, current efforts on maintaining childhood vaccination coverage. In January of this year, CDC published new data providing an updated assessment of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on routine childhood immunization. I will highlight some of the key findings of these reports. Vaccination coverage has dropped a total of two percentage points since the start of the pandemic, decreasing from 95% reported in 2019-2020 school year to 93% in the 2021-22 school year. This steady decline means that nearly 250,000 kindergartners are potentially not protected against measles. Further, measles, mumps, rubella vaccination coverage for kindergarten children is now the lowest it has been in over a decade. As I mentioned yesterday, um, uh, it's additionally concerning that the, uh, uh, that, there is a, that the percent of uninsured children not vaccinated by their second birthday is eight times that of privately insured children, even with VFC in place. There were differences in vaccination coverage among children living in below poverty and in rural areas, with a four to five percent decrease in coverage among children in those groups during the pandemic. These data add to previous research that highlights the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on routine childhood vaccinations, as well as ongoing disparities in coverage and reinforce the importance of vaccination to protect children from serious death and illness. While overall routine vaccination remains high, the recent outbreaks of measles and polio underscore the, the, that under and unvaccinated children are at risk for serious illness. To help address pandemic-related declines in routine immunization, CDC has recently launched Let's Rise, an effort to equip partners and health care uh, providers with actionable strategies, resources, and data to support getting all Americans back on schedule with their routine immunizations. We must all continue to work together and remain vigilant in efforts to ensure that children receive vaccines in, uh, they need in order to protect themselves against a serious and sometimes deadly disease. Before passing this on to CMS for their update, I have two slides to, uh, to answer Dr. Daly's question regarding uh, adults uh, with insufficient uh, coverage, insurance coverage, and their vaccination. Can I please have those two slides? Please indulge me for 30 seconds. So um, uh, the take-home message on this slide is in the box that's highlighted by the uh, orange rectangle. As you can see, if uh, individuals uh, with incomes less than uh, 20, uh, $20,000 a year compared to those with incomes $40,000 or more were less likely uh, to receive uh, influenza vaccination, vaccination. On the right, the take-home message is that adults uh, with an out-of-pocket payment of $30 for a flu influenza vaccine are 58% less likely to get vaccinated than adults that have no out-of-pocket uh, payment. Next slide. So um, current estimates suggest that approximately 35% or one-third of uh, adults ages 18 to 64 are un or underinsured for the first half of 2001. And that breakdown show, is below that, which shows that approximately 14% are uninsured and 21% are underinsured. To the right of that, you can see that there are ethnic uh, and minority uh, disparities um, and, and that these groups are less likely to be vaccinated even if they're covered by insurance. But to address the question that uh, Dr. Daly asked, what about those that are uninsured? You can see that in the light blue boxes, uh, they have the lowest rates of uh, reported receiving a vaccine for influenza uh, in the previous two months. So I think these uh, two slides do show uh, the significant findings for those individuals under and uninsured and point towards the need for a VFA program similar to VFC. 
Uh, thank you very much, and now I will pass it on to CMS. Thank you so much, Dr. Romero. Uh, we invite the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to provide um, their updates. Great, thank you very much, and thank you, Dr. Romero. I'm going to start where Dr. Romero ended and um, kind of pick up on the Inflation Reduction Act provisions that I mentioned yesterday. Um, as I mentioned, specific to Medicare, the big change that took place under the Inflation Reduction Act was to eliminate cost sharing for the Part D, as in David, vaccines for the Medicare program. And that um, started in January of 2023. And Part D plans may not apply a deductible coinsurance or other and really cost sharing requirements for Part D covered adult vaccines recommended by the ACIP. And CMS did issue a fact sheet in December of 2022 highlighting this. Um, it's called the Medicare Part D vaccines. It's an MLN fact sheet. And I've shared the link with our CDC colleagues um, in case anyone wants to look at that or see more information. Getting to Medicaid, which feeds right into the slides that Dr. Romero just showed, there is a larger change coming for adult coverage in Medicaid as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. Beginning in October 2023, the Inflation Reduction Act expands coverage of ACIP recommended adult vaccines without cost sharing for adults in Medicaid and CHIP. So many of you I'm sure already know that in the expansion population for Medicaid, there is already coverage without cost sharing of ACIP recommended vaccines. But for the pre adults who are eligible under the pre expansion, what we call the traditional Medicaid, coverage of vaccines for adults was at state option. And while we know that pretty much every state covered some vaccine, they may not have covered all of the recommended vaccines, nor did they necessarily do it without cost sharing. So this will be a significant change for the Medicaid program. Again, it's effective in October of 2023, and we are in the process of working on guidance that will be released prior to that. Um, and then the other thing I just wanna mention is going back to the, um, the childhood immunization rates that um, Dr. Romero highlighted as well. We um, at CMS continue to work closely with CDC to address these immunization gaps and to work hard to ensure that children in Medicaid and CHIP, um, as well as others who are eligible for VFC, um, are have access to and do obtain their childhood immunizations. And we are committed to continuing to work with CDC to try and reach those children. That's the end of my update. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent update. Um, next, we'll move on to the Food and Drug Administration. Do we have a representative on from the FDA? Okay, we'll move on to the Health Resources and Services Administration. Hi, this is uh, Commander Reed Grimes speaking for uh, Health Resources and Services Administration. The National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, or VICP, continues to process an increased number of claims in fiscal year 2022, petitioners filed 1,029 claims with the VICP. Nearly 196 million was awarded to petitioners and 34.2 million was awarded to pay attorney's fees and costs. In fiscal year 2023, as of February 1st, 2023, petitioners have filed 380 claims with VICP and 61 million has been awarded, including awards to petitioners and for their attorney's fees and costs. In addition, as of February 15th, 2023, the VICP has a backlog of 1,453 claims alleging vaccine injury awaiting review. More data about the VICP can be obtained at www.hersa.gov slash vaccine tech compensation slash data slash index .html. For the countermeasures injury compensation program, as of February 1st, 2023, 11,196 claims alleging injuries or death from COVID-19 countermeasures have been filed with the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, or CICP, 
including 8,447 claims alleging injuries from COVID-19 vaccines. CICP has rendered decisions on 543 COVID-19 claims, 19 COVID-19 countermeasure claims, all of which are COVID-19 vaccine claims, have been determined eligible for compensation and are pending a review of eligible expenses. 524 COVID-19 countermeasure claims have been denied compensation because requested medical records were not submitted, 144 of those. The filing deadline was missed, 141. The request did not specify a CICP covered products, 251, or the standard of proof for causation was not met and or a covered injury was not sustained, and that's 88. More information about the CICP can be found at www.hrsa.gov slash CICP. That is all for the HRSA updates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll move on to the Indian Health Service. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, the Indian Health Service continues to prioritize access, quality, and equity in vaccine distribution and administration for American Indian and Alaska Native tribal communities served by the IHS system of care. During the COVID pandemic, IHS has worked closely with our federal and tribal partners to ensure vaccine access and to support vaccine acceptance. We are currently engaged in efforts to promote primary series and bivalent booster vaccination in all age groups in every region. Throughout the MPOX public health emergency, IHS took a proactive approach to the distribution and administration of Geneos vaccine among high-risk persons and tribal communities. Recognizing the potential impacts on our service population, IHS was among the first of the jurisdictions to expand access to Geneos vaccine as pre-exposure prophylaxis as part of our MPOX PrEP initiative, which was implemented broadly across our system of care. Multiple IHS areas and facilities also implemented equity pilot projects to enhance vaccine access for our most vulnerable patients. Finally, I'm pleased to report that in November, IHS announced a new national vaccine strategy. The E3 vaccine initiative is designed to promote access for every patient at every encounter to every recommended vaccine when appropriate. This includes all ACIP recommended vaccines in all age groups, which are provided at no cost to our American Indian and Alaska Native service population. Working in collaboration with key stakeholders, especially tribal communities, IHS seeks to leverage the lessons learned from the COVID vaccine campaign to improve general vaccination rates in tribal communities. Our E3 operational plan includes a bottom-up approach to encourage innovation, incentivize effort, and recognize success, drawing on the adaptability of our comprehensive healthcare system to cross-pollinate federal, tribal, and urban Indian programs using best practices developed in Indian country for Indian country. We look forward to continued collaboration with our tribal, urban, and federal partners to ensure safe uh, access to effective vaccines across the age spectrum for American Indians and Alaska Natives served by the Indian Health Service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Clark. Next, we'll move on to the National Institute of Health. Yeah, good morning. This is John Bigel from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Uh, the NIH continues to support basic and clinical research to improve human health. And a large part of that is uh, in, uh, developing, uh, preventing infectious disease by in developing new and, and better vaccines. I wanted to highlight a few uh, studies that may be of interest to the ACIP. Uh, for COVID-19, NIAID has a, a preprint for early serologic responses uh, uh, from a randomized trial comparing a uh, uh, COVID uh, wild type uh, BA1 uh, versus uh, wild type BA4-5 bivalent. Um, there's a lot of discussion of the whether the BA1 or the BA4-5 bivalent is uh, better. Uh, this is not a, a efficacy study, but helps uh, gives a very detailed uh, immunologic um, uh, response. Um, so it helps inform that uh, that discussion. Uh, for Ebola, um, a group at the NIH has developed a, a vaccine against uh, Sudan uh, Ebola virus um, uh, that was uh, causing outbreaks in, in Uganda. The, this completely protected uh, macaques against the uh, Sudan virus challenge. 
Um, it's not yet entered into to human studies. Fortunately, the outbreak has seemed to uh, be under control, but having an effective uh, vaccine uh, is, is important, and this is the first uh, step in that. Um, the uh, Marburg virus, uh, the uh, group at the N uh, NIH uh, uh, developed an experimental uh, Marburg virus and, and was uh, put into phase one trials and first in human trials, which showed it was safe and, and generated a robust uh, uh, immune response. Again, the, the, the Marburg causes periodic outbreaks and having a, uh, an effective vaccine is, is uh, quite important uh, for uh, prevention of uh, disease. So this is a a tremendous first step. Um, HIV uh, continues to be elusive for vaccines. There's one uh, study I just want to uh, highlight. There was a, a, a large study that people, a lot of people had interest in uh, called uh, Mosaico, which was an uh, investigational HIV vaccine uh, that uh, used in men that have sex with men and transgender uh, people and it was uh, safe, but it was not uh, uh, protective, and, and the DSMB recommended that study uh, be be stopped. That study is still in in follow up, um, but the the initial uh, the reporting of the, the the reasons it was stopped has been made uh, public. Uh, the, the last thing I want to highlight is a, a study about malaria. This is actually monoclonal, uh, not a vaccine, but. Uh, I still think it's, it's very interesting. One dose of a monoclonal antibody was shown uh, to be uh, safe and protective, 82% pre uh, effective at preventing infection in non-pregnant adults in Mali. So it's the first time that uh, monoclonal antibody prevented malaria infection in an endemic uh, region. So uh, again, a, a tremendous first step and, and hopefully uh, a, a target uh, towards a more effective uh, a malaria uh, vaccine. Uh, there are several other studies that uh, that I'll be uh, noting in the written updates, and all these will come with links uh, to the to the primary uh, articles. Uh, and that concludes the updates from the uh, National Institute of Health. Thank you very much for that update. Um, Next, we'll move to the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, the, uh, these are the updates from the Office of the Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Um, in January 2023, the Vaccine Schedule Implementation Plan was approved by the HHS uh, Secretary, Xavier Becerra, and the Assistant Secretary for Health, uh, Admiral Rachel Levine. The implementation plan is a companion document to the Vaccine's National St Strategic Plan, which was published in January 2021, uh, which describes the specific actions that federal agencies will take to eliminate vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, the actions described in the uh, in the plan align with the national uh, vaccine plan across the five stated major goals. The implementation plan was developed in collaboration with the Federal Interagency Vaccine Workgroup, or IVWG, uh, which consists of senior leadership from 11 U.S. departments, uh, 11 U.S. Um, uh, Department of Health and Human Services agencies and three additional federal departments. Uh, the Vaccines Federal Implementation Plan uh, highlights the vaccine development, administration, and policy based on the federal agency's missions and priorities. Uh, the National Vaccine Program uh, will continue to monitor the implementation and report out on its progress. The Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health will host a webinar entitled The Importance of Preventive Services and Lessons Learned from the Pandemic uh, in, on March 21. The, uh, the program will discuss the following three Healthy People 2030 ob objectives. Uh, first is Immunization and Infectious Diseases Objective number nine, uh, which is to increase the proportion of uh, persons who are vaccinated annually against the seasonal influenza. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, the, uh, uh, the vaccination rate against seasonal influenza has been identified in Healthy People 2030 as a leading health indicator for uh, the immunization and, and infectious diseases uh, uh, subcomponent sub of Healthy People 2030. Uh, the other two uh, Healthy People 2030 objectives uh, that will be discussed uh, are increase the proportion of pregnant women who receive early and adequate prenatal care and uh, and the uh, reduction of congenital syphilis. And lastly, the uh, the uh, on 
an update on the National Vaccine Advisory Committee, um, NVAC. Um, uh, NVAC met uh, on February 2 and 3 um, earlier this year. And during the uh, virtual two-day meeting, the uh, NVAC heard from experts and scientists who presented information on immunization equity, vaccine safety, uh, vaccine innovation, and other topics. Uh, this meeting was supported uh, supported NVAC subcommittees who are working to address the charges. Uh, Adm Admiral Rachel Levine, the Assistant Secretary for Health, gave, gave the Committee on Vaccine Safety and Innovation in Immunization. Uh, there are two other uh, uh, in-person meetings scheduled for 2023, 20, uh, one in June and another in September. And additional information about these meetings will be posted on the NVAC website. And that concludes my updates from OIDP. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Uh, we appreciate the wide range of vaccination efforts across the government and the updates and continued collaboration um, with our federal, federal agencies. Um, before we launch into the first session, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Bata if she would please uh, state her name, her affiliation, and whether she has any conflicts of interest. Good morning. Lynn Bata. I'm the immunization clinical consultant um, at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflicts. Thank you very much. So we will now move on to our first session of the day. Dr. Kathy Paling um, will provide an introduction and overview of today's meningococcal vaccine session. Dr. Paling. All right, good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to present on behalf of the meningococcal vaccine work group. All right, here is the list of the current work group members, the CDC contributors, and our grade and ETR support. A special thanks to each and every one of these members who makes a huge um, difference in these conversations. All right, so first we want to recap the October meeting. Um, the work group presented on a couple of topics the new MenVO one vial presentation and the two new men AC, uh, ABCWY vaccines, one of which will be produced by GSK and the other by Pfizer. During the latter presentation, we described the work group's policy questions and PICOs, and then we described the work group's plans for the near future. All right, GSK's clinical trials were not available in time to review for this meeting. So in October, we said we were going to do them at the same time. Um, but because of this um, timing, we will, um, our review for the two vaccines are now going to be decoupled moving forward. We will continue to aim to be ready for an ACIP vote on the Pfizer vaccine at October meeting, presuming licensure occurs before then but we now have some additional time to prepare for the GSK vaccine vote. Here's the revised proposed timeline of the next few ACIP meetings. Today, we will be presenting on the epidemiology of meningococcal disease in the United States, and Pfizer will present their clinical trial. In June, we'll cover grade, evidence to recommendation, and the cost-effectiveness study for the Pfizer vaccine. GSK will be presenting their clinical trial data. In October, we are preparing to have an ACIP vote on the Pfizer vaccine if it's licensed by then. We'll also present grade and evidence to the recommendation in the cost effectiveness study for the GSK vaccine. GSK has not confirmed when its vaccine will be ready for a vote, but the work group will be prepared. Since the October ACIP meeting, GSK and Pfizer presented on their pentavalent vaccines and the work group asked clarifying questions. The work group also considered whether to revisit the current adolescent immunization schedule based on the discussions during the October ACIP meeting. These topics are somewhat intertwined, so we needed to determine how to proceed. At our January workgroup meeting, we decided to postpone the assessment of the schedule until after both pentavalent vaccines have been reviewed because of the complexity of these reviews and an unclear picture of how meningococcal disease epidemiology might be evolving after the two years of COVID-19. 
We will plan to revisit this topic in the spring of 2024 when another year of epidemiologic data is available to better inform this discussion. Now, I'll tell you about the three presentations today. First, we'll hear about the latest epidemiology of meningococcal in the United States. Next, Pfizer will present its pentavalent vaccine clinical trial data, and then we'll wrap up with the work group's um, interpretation of Pfizer's data. Thank you, and I'm happy to turn it over. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ruby? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, today, I will describe the current epidemiology of meningococcal disease and review recent notable cases and outbreaks. Meningococcal disease cases are reported to CDC through the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System, or NNDSS, and additional serogroup and outcome information, along with other clinical characteristics, are collected from all jurisdictions through Enhanced Meningococcal Disease Surveillance, or EMDS. All available isolates are also submitted to CDC for whole genome sequencing as part of EMDS. Meningococcal disease surveillance data are typically finalized in the fall of the following year, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been delays in obtaining and finalizing NNDSS and EMDS data. 2020 data are final, but 2021 and 2022 data are not final yet. We know cases were low in 2020 and 2021 because of COVID-19 mitigation measures, but we don't have a complete sense of what happened in 2022. For 2022, we have collected preliminary case counts with age and serogroup information, but this data is less complete than we expect final data to be. Additionally, we have not yet received and tested all available isolates for 2021 and 2022 to confirm serogroup and antimicrobial susceptibility. Since the late 1990s, a sustained decline in the incidence of meningococcal disease has been observed in the US, decreasing from 1.2 to 0.11 cases per 100,000 population from 1996 to 2019. This decline in incidence began prior to the introduction of a quadrivalent meningococcal conjugate or MEN-ACWY vaccine in adolescence or the availability of serogroup B or MEN-B vaccines. During the COVID-19 pandemic, cases declined to a preliminary incidence of 0.06 cases per 100,000 population in 2021. And in 2022, cases increased almost 50% to a preliminary incidence of 0.09 cases per 100,000 population. Incidence is still below pre-pandemic levels, but we don't know if cases will stabilize at this level or continue to rebound. Incidence has decreased over time in all three primary disease-causing serogroups, B, C, and Y, shown here in the blue, purple, and green lines, with incidence of serogroup W and other serogroups remaining stably low. During 2020 and 2021, the largest declines in incidence were observed for serogroup B. In 2022, there was an increase in serogroup C to above pre-pandemic levels, driven largely by one outbreak that I will describe later. This figure shows the incidence by age group and serogroup from 2010 through 2019. Serogroup B is shown in blue, serogroups A, C, W, and Y are shown collectively in yellow, and cases with other or unknown serogroup are in gray. Incidence and serogroup distribution vary by age group, with the highest incidence observed in children aged less than two years and adults aged greater than 85 years. A peak in incidence is also observed among adolescents and young adults aged 16 to 25 years. Serogroup B is the predominant serogroup in children aged less than five years. In children and adolescents aged five to 20 years, serogroup B accounts for approximately half of cases. And in adults aged greater than 20 years, serogroups C, W, and Y cause the majority of disease. In 2020 through 2022, we saw slightly different incidence distribution across age groups. Overall incidence during this time period was lower than the previous slide, 
but declines in 26 to 64 year olds were not as pronounced as in other age groups. Now I will highlight some recent unusual developments in meningococcal disease epidemiology in the US. Historically, resistance to any of the antibiotics used for treatment or prophylaxis of meningococcal disease was rare, but in 2020, a ciprofloxacin and penicillin-resistant serogroup Y case was identified. To date, 27 ciprofloxacin and penicillin-resistant serogroup Y cases have been reported from 2019 through 2022, occurring primarily among Hispanic or Latino persons. These cases were in individuals aged less than one to 97 years, only one case occurred in individuals 11 to 20 years of age. This is consistent with our expectation not to see cases in this age group since they're routinely recommended to receive ACWY vaccine and should be protected from serogroup Y. None of the ciprofloxacin and penicillin resistant serogroup Y cases were in vaccinated individuals. Here's a more detailed look at the ciprofloxacin and penicillin-resistant serogroup Y cases, or dual-resistant cases, shown here in purple. Meningococcal disease incidence per 100,000 population is overlaid as the black line using the right y-axis scale. And as shown earlier, we saw large declines in reported meningococcal disease incidence in 2020 and 2021. While preliminary incidence for 2021 is approximately half the incidence of 2019, we have seen the same number of dual resistant cases reported so far for 2021 compared to 2019. As previously mentioned, we have not received and tested all available isolates for 2021 and especially 2022, so the number of resistant cases may increase. We've also seen some unusual outbreaks over the past year. First, during 2022 in Florida, we saw the largest outbreak of cases predominantly among men who have sex with men or MSM that's been reported to CDC. To date, there have been 43 serogroup C cases, including nine deaths. All 43 cases are genetically closely related. 12 of the 43 cases were either men not known to be MSM or were female, but the isolates from these cases are genetically closely related to those from the MSM cases. 15 of the 43 cases occurred in people living with HIV, and the ages of cases ranged from 20 to 77 years with a mean and median in the 30s. The second outbreak is a community outbreak caused by what appears to be an unusually lethal strain of serogroup Y. Since mid-June, 11 cases have been reported with three deaths for a case fatality rate of 27%. The average case fatality rate for serogroup Y cases for the past five years was 12%. 10 of the 11 cases were in Black or African American persons, and the age range is 30 to 78 years. No connections have been identified among any of the cases to date. In the past few months, we have started to see cases of this strain in other states affecting a similar population to this outbreak and with a similarly elevated case fatality rate, but with no known epidemiologic connections to the outbreak. We've also continued to see outbreaks among people experiencing homelessness with one small serogroup C outbreak each year in 2021 and 2022. In summary, incidence of meningococcal disease declined in 2020 and 2021, but increased in 2022. In recent years, we have seen new strains emerging in the US, and both new serogroup Y strains are predominantly affecting racial and ethnic minority groups. Given these unusual new strains, it's unclear how meningococcal disease epidemiology may change in the coming years. More complete 2022 data will be available in the fall of this year, and these data, combined with additional years of data post-pandemic, will provide a clearer picture of current meningococcal disease epidemiology. We are seeing an increase in cases following the COVID-19 pandemic, but we need more years of data to understand whether the number of cases will level off, and if so, when. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. This presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Paling. Thank you for this presentation. 
Um, I wanted to ask, um, in the um, dual resistant, it was clear there were no vaccinated cases. When we look at the outbreak in Florida, um, the um, Meninge C and in the um, unusually lethal group, serogroup group Y, were any of the cases known to be vaccinated with the conjugate vaccine? In the MSM outbreak in Florida, three of the cases were vaccinated, but the most recent dose of vaccine was received seven to 10 years ago in those three cases. And in the um, SEER group Y outbreak, none of those cases were known to have received vaccine. Any additional questions? Um, one clarifying question, you know, you had mentioned these specific um, cases of resistance and then certain outbreaks. Is it geographically clustered in some way? Sorry. Oh, you can't hear. Is it geographically clustered in some way? So the resistant cases are not um, geographically clustered in one area. Um, several of the cases have been reported in one metro area, but um, the 27 cases are spread across the country. Dr. Juthari. Thank you. Um, regarding that same isolate and those resistant cases, those 27 cases, I understand that there, what I've understood is that there's no epidemiologic link between these cases, but are the isolates, do we know if they are absolutely identical uh, genetically, or is it just phenotypically based on resistance profile, they appear the same? They um, are genetically closely related from whole genome sequencing. Thank you. We'll move on to the next presentation. Um, the next presentation is Dr. Jason McGuire from Pfizer presenting on the Pfizer pentavalent meningococcal vaccine. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jason McGuire, and thank you for the opportunity to present our meningococcal pentavalent uh, vaccine safety and immunogenicity data this morning. Um, we are seeking uh, licensure for our pentavalent meningococcal vaccine, which I will refer to as Penta moving forward as two doses administered at least six months apart in 10 to 25 year olds to prevent invasive meningococcal disease or IMD caused by all five zero groups or as a single dose for ACWI. Penta is composed of two vaccines, Trumemba, which is licensed in the US, the EU, and elsewhere, and Nymenrix, which although not licensed in the US, is used extensively elsewhere. I'm sure everyone here is well-versed with the current US adolescent meningococcal vaccination platform, which is displayed in gray and gold across the top row. The pentavalent development program was designed to generate data that would inform how Penta might generally be incorporated across the platform and provide the maximum protection against all five zero groups. Here's one option of how it could be incorporated. As a single dose in early adolescence to protect against IMD caused by zero groups A, C, W, and Y, and as two doses six months apart in later adolescence to both boost A, C, W, Y, and protect against men B, I, and D. The Penta development program includes studies supporting the proposed posology for two doses, six to 12 months apart to protect against all five zero groups and a single dose to protect against ACWI, as well as a study including a booster dose administered four years after completing the primary series. So the Penta clinical development program consists of three main studies involving more than 4,000 participants who are naive to prior MenB vaccination. In the phase three study, 80% of the participants were Caucasian, 10% Black or African American, and 25% Hispanic or Latino. In the top study, the phase three study, this evaluated Penta administered on a zero six month schedule in approximately 2,400 ACW naive and ACWI primed adolescents and young adults compared to Trumemba administered on a zero six month schedule and co-administered with Menveo at dose one. This study is now complete 
and we will be presenting ACWY responses after one or two doses of Penta in naive and primed individuals and B responses after two doses in all participants. The middle study is a phase two study uh, of safety and immunogenicity in approximately 300 ABCWY naive 11 to 14 year olds with a Penta group dosed on a zero 12 month schedule who are now in the persistence follow-up phase and a zero 36 month schedule group who will be receiving their second dose later this year. We will be presenting the ABCWY responses on the zero 12 month schedule. The bottom study is a phase two Penta zero six month two dose study in approximately 1600 participants, which includes a four year immunopersistence phase and booster dose safety and immunogenicity evaluation, uh, which uh, is now complete. And we will be presenting the persistence and booster data in ACW naive participants. So I'm going to present reactogenicity data for the phase three study primary vaccination series by vaccine and group, noting that there was no clinically significant differences between ACW naive and primed individuals or between the primary vaccination schedule and the booster dose. E-diaries were used to collect reactogenicity data for seven days following each vaccination. Local reactogenicity was measured in the arm where either Penta or Trumemba were administered, local reactogenicity to Menveo administered in the contralateral arm was not evaluated. In this graph, pain, swelling, and redness at the injection sites are represented by frequency and severity with vaccination one on the top row and vaccination two in the bottom row. Penta represented on the left and Trumemba on the right for each symptom. Most events were mild to moderate in severity with a trend to slightly higher proportions experiencing events in the Penta group compared to Trumemba. And there was a reduction in both groups between vaccination one and two. Pain at the injection site was most frequently experienced local event and proportions are consistent with what is already known for Trumemba. Minor differences in point estimates were considered not clinically significant and there were no withdrawals from the phase three study due to either local or systemic reactogenicity events. Systemic reactogenicity events are displayed similarly. And again, the pattern is consistent with what we already know for Trumemba, with fatigue and headache being the most frequently experienced systemic events, again, mostly mild to moderate in severity and no clinically significant differences between either group or vaccination one and two. Frequencies of other systemic events are even lower and we observed no fevers greater than 40 Celsius in any participant in, these, in this study. So for unsolicited adverse events, rates were similar between the Penta and Trumemba Menveo groups for adverse events at around 20%, for medically attended adverse events at around 15%, Although there were, uh, there were also very few related or severe events uh, in this study. Although there were seven serious adverse events in the Penta group during the vaccination phase and none in the Trumemba Menveo group, none of these were considered vaccine related. There were slightly more newly diagnosed chronic medical conditions occurring in the Penta group compared to the Trumemba Menveo group of which the majority were psychiatric disorders, and in particular, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder for which further investigation confirmed that for most of these cases, symptoms of ADH were present prior to study entry and formal diagnosis. So in terms of immunogenicity objectives, I'm going to focus on the hypothesis testing endpoints agreed upon with the FDA in the top left two blue boxes. One and two dose hypothesis testing for all five zero groups included zero responses, which were defined as a proportion of participants achieving a greater than or equal to fourfold rise in HSBA titers above baseline. And for two doses, the zero group B composite response, which is the proportion achieving protective titers greater than or equal to one to eight or one to 16, depending on the strain for all four zero group B test strains combined. Non-inferiority was achieved for zero groups ACWI and the four men B test strains 
when the lower bound confidence interval for the difference between the proportion of participants achieving serial responses was greater than negative 10%. The approach taken for assessment of men B bactericidal responses for Penta was the same as that which supported the licensure of Trumemba in the US and non-inferiority was defined the same as for ACWI. Let's take a look now at Penta immunogenicity data in the ACW naive population and specifically data supporting that one dose of Penta can be used as an alternative to ACWI vaccine in naive adolescents. So if we compare serial responses after one dose of Penta in the blue bars to one dose of Menveo in the pink bars in the phase three study, Penta responses were higher and non-inferior to Menveo for serial groups ACWY and for serial groups CNY, Penta serial responses rates were statistically higher compared to Menveo. Also 82 to 99% of Penta recipients achieved protective titers. Going forward for the purpose of comparison, comparing vaccine immunogenicity, pentagroups will dis be displayed as blue bars or lines, Menveo as pink, and Trumemba as green. Since we're seeking licensure of Penta as a two-dose series to provide protection against all five serial groups, it was also important to evaluate the ACWI responses following two doses administered relatively close together and as expected, two doses of Penta elicited higher and non-inferior responses compared to one dose of Menveo in naive adolescents. For serial groups C, W, and Y, Penta serial responses were statistically higher, highlighting the potential benefit of that second dose of Penta. Also, greater than 99% of Penta recipients achieved protective titers. Among men B naive participants after two doses, Penta responses trended higher than for Trumemba, and Penta was non-inferior to Trumemba across the board against all four test strains, as well as the composite response. Responses were statistically higher for two of the test strains, specifically B24 and B44, and the composite response. Also, between 83 to 99% of Penta recipients achieve protective titers. We've already shown data for the zero six month schedule displayed again here in columns two through four. For 11 to 14 year old adolescents, again, naive to all five serial groups, when Penta was administered on a zero 12 month schedule, uh, those results are displayed within the red bordered area. ACWI serial responses were similarly high for both schedules. Serial group B responses were generally higher for the 12 month schedule, which is highlighted in green compared with the six month schedule, which is highlighted in blue, albeit under different study conditions. Also following the two dose zero 12 month schedule, 98 to 100% of Penta recipients achieve zero protective titers. So I think the key takeaway from the data presented thus far is that in ACW naive individuals around 11 to 12 years of age, when they would be receiving their first dose of an ACWI conjugate vaccine in the US, a single dose of Penta can be used as an alternative and two doses, either six or 12 months apart, provides protection against all five zero groups. Given the current platform of preventing IND caused by zero groups ACW and Y is based on the consensus that the first dose in early adolescence provides protection until a second dose is administered later in adolescence to maintain protection through early adulthood, our phase two proof of concept study included a four year immunopersistence follow up phase and a booster stage. During the four years following a two dose series of Penta or four and a half years following a single dose of Menveo, proportions of participants with protected titers for ACWI did decline to a lesser degree, though, in the Penta recipients compared to Menveo, but they overall remained high with a substantial proportion still protected four years out. After Penta booster dose, GMT did rise above those following the primary series with 100% serial protected across all four serial groups. Proportions with protected titers for the four men B test range over the four years following the two dose primary series were similar between the Penta and Trumemba groups and similar to what has been observed in prior Trumemba studies. 
declining over the first year and may, remaining stable thereafter. However, again, we see a very robust anamnestic response with 95 to 100% zero protected following the booster dose. Considering older adolescents who have received a single dose of an ACWI conjugate vaccine in early adolescence, Penta could potentially boost primed individuals against zero groups ACW and Y. So in primed individuals, ACWI zero responses were non-inferior for one dose of Penta compared to one dose of Menveo, and near 100% of Penta participants achieved zero protective titers, showing that Penta could be used as an alternative to ACWI conjugates in primed adolescents. These data show that in primed individuals, two doses of Penta could also be used as an alternative to one dose of an ACWI conjugate and two doses of a MenB vaccine. For ACWI in the left bar graph, two doses of Penta was non-inferior to a single dose of Menveo in primed individuals and 99 to 100% achieved zero protective titers after two doses. Recall in the phase two uh, Penta persistence and booster study, 100% of prime participants receiving two doses of Penta on a zero six month schedule were still protected with titers greater than or equal to one to eight after four years. For the bar graph on the right, remember all participants were B naive in this study. So these data are for the full phase three study population. And as we already showed on an earlier slide, this is just a reminder that men B zero responses after two doses of Penta trended higher than for two doses of Trumemba. And lastly, in primed individuals, close to 100% remain zero protected for the four or four and a half years after completing two doses of Penta or one dose of Menveo. So in conclusion, uh, Penta was well, well tolerated and safe. A single dose could be used as an ACWI conjugate alternative in naive and primed individuals. Two doses administered on a 06 or 012 schedule provide a high degree of protection against all five zero groups. After two doses of Penta around 11 to 12 years of age, a single dose can boost all five zero groups at age 16. A single dose of Penta could be used as a booster for ACWI at around age 16. And immunopersistence after two doses of Penta is similar to a single dose of ACWI conjugate and two doses of Trumemba. So thank you for attention. Uh, this work could not have been accomplished without the generous contributions and involvement of our study participants. The investigators and their staff or uh, research organizations and other vendors and other partners. Uh, thank you and, and we'll go ahead and uh, entertain questions. Thank you very much. And this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Daly. Um, anticipating a question, I think, Dr. Lee. Right? Um, so could you please go to the slide that has serious adverse events and medically attended adverse events? Um, and then while you're pulling that up, I'll, I'll ask my question, which is just that it, I feel like it's always helpful to hear what the serious adverse events were and the medically attended adverse events. So, um, so uh, the related first, what were the related medically attended events? And then second, what were the uh, SAEs? Thank you. So let me go to backup slides for that. Um, where is that? Okay, so um, for our SAEs, you can see, um, uh, in the uh, left side column, our pentavalent vaccine, and on the right column, the uh, uh, Menveo and uh, Trumemba. So again, as I mentioned earlier, there were no events during the vaccination phase in the Trumemba Menveo group, but you can see we had uh, nine events and seven participants in the Penta group. So we had a case of salmonella, um, one case of depression, anxiety, and suicide attempts, POTS, dyspnea, head injury, traumatic spinal cord injury, 
and depression with suicidal ideation. And you can see the time course for onset of those uh, after uh, their prior vaccination. In the vaccination follow-up phase, we had five events and four participants in the pentagroup. We had a post-tonsillectomy hemorrhage and oral intolerance, uh, a fracture related to a go-kart injury, depression, and another uh, uh, mood disorder. And then in the uh, Trumemba Menveo group, we had a appendicitis, E. coli, UTI, drug overdose, and uh, a migraine headache. Um, thank you so much. Dr. Lee, can I ask a quick follow-up question? Um, so is, so I recognize that the POTS in this case, the uh, postural orthostatic um, tachycardia was many days after vaccination, but is that, is that a adverse event of special interest in your, in your post-licensure um, evaluation of the precede, the vaccines that precede this pentavalent vaccine? Thank you. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, this particular individual uh, had a history of episodes of fainting and, and other uh, similar uh, orthostatic types prior to entry into the study. Thank you. Dr. Lair? Thank you for this presentation. Um, I have a question and a comment. The question first is, I assume you have a backup slide with who is in the study? So age, gender, ethnicity, um, immunocompromised. I didn't see that in your presentation. Yep. I'm heading there right now. Which one is there? So here's our phase three study demographics. You can see it was pretty equal across um, uh, genders. Again, we had um, about 78% who were uh, white, 10% who were black, African-American, about 2.5% uh, Asian, uh, and then the remainder relatively low. We had 1.6% multiracial. Again, about 25% were Hispanic or Latino. And uh, just based on the design of the, the uh, study, uh, we had about two thirds of the participants were uh, children, and then uh, one third were adults. Uh, you could see the mean age at first vaccination was about 16 years. And again, 75% um, of the participants uh, were from the US, the remaining from the European Union. Thank you. Do you have any information on immunocompromised? Uh, immunocompromised individuals uh, were excluded from the study uh, uh, if they had uh, immune diseases that were considered would potentially put them at increased risk for participation in the study or, or were felt they would not mount a specific immune response uh, to the vaccine. Again, this study was designed to be done in uh, healthy adults. So thank you. And then my comment is that I'm glad that the vaccine works and it's pretty evident that it's equivalent to two separate vaccines. I appreciate all the data. I guess I do want to remind people that right now the ACIP does not have an indication for men B at age 11. Um, so this is information which is outside the normal schedule. And the other one is that we are literally talking about one in a million that the case incidence rate, um, when you talk about 0.1 per 100,000, is honestly one in a million cases. So that's just, I think, very relevant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Dr. Cotton? Thank you for the interesting presentation. It looks as though you are gearing for um, an indication in young adults. And uh, as an adult provider, I, I give this type of vaccine to people who've undergone splenectomy and who have other indications. Is the focus here just intended to be children and young adults in that that's who you studied? Uh, well, currently that, that is uh, what we are seeking licensure for. Um, we're currently uh, conducting a study in Trumemba on uh, asplenic uh, or uh, asplenic either by surgery or uh, uh, sickle cell disease uh, in Europe uh, at this time. 
Thank you. There, there's another population of people who are getting um, complement inhibitors like ecolizumab. Do you think at some point the company might be interested in looking at vaccine response in that highly vulnerable population? Uh, we're not planning to do that at this time. Thank you. Dr. Long. Thank you. If these are in fact just, uh, not just, but two vaccines that we know well put together, to what do you attribute what looks to be statistically significant increase in those attaining one to eight of the human serum bactericidal antibody titer? Hi everyone, my name is Paul Balmer. I'm the, the medical lead for our meningococcal franchise here in, at Pfizer. Um, so thank you for the question. It, it's data which we obviously are interested in. We actually do not have a real explanation of some of the higher titers that you observe for the pentavalent vaccine, in particular for the serum group B responses, which probably have um, brought this to your attention. And the only thing that we can speculate is that through the combination, we are increasing uh, immunogenicity in terms of the fact that you now have an ACWY conjugate vaccine included with a tetanus toxoid protein carrier. But ultimately, we do not have an explanation of those higher responses. Uh, may I have a follow-up question, Dr. Lee? Um, I suspect the work group committee will want to see geometric geometric mean antibody titers as well as the percent attaining the one to eight. Um, and then I think it's your slide 11. What do you think is the biologic plausibility of a lack of a boost or an inferior response when to meningococcal serum group B? That's not the right slide, I'm sorry. It's our number 11, but it is the one that shows uh, two doses given either six or 12 months apart with red, with red Bach. There it is. So if you tell us about the one month after the second dose, the last line on the left column, uh, at six months, only 76% or 78% attained one to eight. And after 12 months, 96% did. What is the biologic plausibility of that? Do you have an idea? So again, that is, that's the composite response. So that would be proportion with titers um, greater than 1 to 8 or 1 to 16 um, uh, in all four uh, serial group B test strains. So we already know um, that in particular for men B, if we extend the interval between the doses, we see an enhancement in HSBA responses. Uh, this was observed uh, previously uh, with dosing for two member when it was extended from a zero one or zero two to a zero six month schedule. And it appears that the same observation holds true for zero 12 months. So this is partly why we want to evaluate the option of extended intervals and uh, these data on a zero 12 month do offer further flexibility to dosing and how to utilize the vaccination. And just a reminder, we're also um, on a zero 36 month schedule. Uh, oh yeah. Your, I can hear you now, Dr. Sorry. Chai. I think you're unmuted. Okay, let me share a screen and show you what I can pull up. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions? Um, Dr. Paling. Um, Dr. McGuire, could you go back two slides, please? Thank you. Um, and I wanted um, to point out in response to your question um, that it's important to notice that this is a naive person and you're comparing two doses of the pentavalent to a single dose of the regular vaccine. And so, um, it's not a surprise you'd see a difference. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yeah, that's absolutely correct. And, and that was by agreement with the FDA that we would do that comparison. But what I think it shows that even with two doses, uh, we didn't see an increase in reactogenicity uh, or adverse events. 
uh, and that we were also able to provide protection, obviously, against zero group B. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Yes. Um, will the recommendation be for all um, individuals 10 to 25, even though the immunocompromised were excluded from the um, from the study, and those may be the ones that most likely actually need the vaccine. Yeah, I, I don't think we can give recommendations. Just you know that uh, our indication that we are seeking is in that age group for uh, two doses to protect against all five zero groups, or one dose to protect against ACWY only. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you for the presentation. My question is uh, duration of antibody persistence, and it was up to four years. Um, are they? Are you planning on looking at it more closer to ten or five? What, uh, not this time. We, we may potentially use modeling, and there's been some discussion internally about how we could model based on the data we have out to uh, longer time frames. Ms. McNally. Dr. McGuire, I'm sorry, I think I just missed it, but can you just remind us of the total number of participants who are primed adolescents? Thank you. Uh, sure. In the uh, phase three uh, study, it was about half of the population of that study, so around 1,500 participants. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Um, and uh, looking forward, do you have any anticipation of cost per dose? Because that should factor into our considerations. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Alejandro Cane. I'm the medical lead for vaccines and antivirals in the US for Pfizer. Uh, as, as you know, it is important to know that our Penta vaccine has not been approved by the FDA and the list price for the vaccine has not been yet finalized. As part of the regulatory process, Pfizer is targeting a value price approach that will eventually support the routine vaccination for NHF recommendations set by the ACIP. Once it's finalized, the light price should not be uh, impacting the price by patients, and, and the CDC will know the, the price as, as soon as we get it. Dr. Paley? Um, I've got another clarifying question. I wanted to ask about the um, uh, men ACWY component. Is that the same as that that's licensed here in the United States currently? Thank you. No, so uh, the Penta ACWY component is Nymanrix, uh, which is licensed in the EU and other countries, but not currently licensed in the US. Again, that's a men ACWY tetanus toxoid conjugate vaccine. Thank you. And has there been any head to head studies on that? Well, the, the only comparison that we've made in this study is, you know, between the tetanus toxoid vaccine and men ACWY CRM or Menveo. Thank you. Um, just one last comment, and I, I want to pick up on a theme that my colleagues um, highlighted, uh, and they highlighted it very nicely, which was um, it'll be really important for us to consistently have information on trial participants, the diversity and inclusion characteristics of those participants, and in particular, um, whether or not the, um, uh, the diversity of the clinical trial population mirrors that of the U.S. population. Um, in addition, I, I would just say that the clinical impact for those of us on the front line caring for some of these patients is huge for the immunocompromised, asplenic, and those who are on echolizumab, that population. And so um, actually the trials in, in those populations are critically important and actually incredibly impactful. Um, so 
it would be really helpful to ensure just in thinking about the presentation um, and not, you know, it's not specific to Pfizer, I would say just uh, we are looking for more consistency across the clinical trial presentations to ensure that we have a good understanding of the population and whether um, it's reflective of the populations we are hoping to vaccinate. Um, so thank you very much. And we will move on to the next presentation. Um, Dr. Sam Crow will be presenting work group considerations. Good morning. I'll now present on the work group's interpretation of Pfizer's MIN-A-B-C-W-Y vaccine clinical trials data. So before jumping into the work group's interpretation, I wanted to remind everyone of our policy questions. First, should the pentavalent vaccine be included as an option for MIN-A-C-W-Y MIN-B vaccination in people currently recommended to receive both vaccines? So 16-year-olds are an example of this. They're recommended to get mini CWI and can get min B based on shared clinical decision making. Second, should the pentavalent vaccine be included as an option for people currently recommended to receive mini CWI only? An example would be 11 to 12 year olds. Third, should the pentavalent vaccine be included as an option for people currently recommended to receive min and B only? For example, during a serogroup B outbreak. Of note, the work group decided to add the second and third policy questions because of concern that some providers might not carry the mini CWI and MIMB vaccines once the pentavalent vaccines become available. So the five uh, vaccines comprised of the Menrix, serogroup CWI, and Trememba, serogroup B, as we just heard. Trememba is currently licensed and available in the U.S., and Menrix is not, but used extensively in Europe and elsewhere. Two related clinical trials have been completed. They assess the safety and immunogenicity of the pentavalent vaccine by comparing it to Tremimba and Minveo. The trials included participants 10 through 25 years of age and studied single and two dose year and six month schedules. Four year persistence and a booster dose were also evaluated. An extended interval study is currently underway. It has two arms, one assessing 12 months between doses and the other 36 between doses. 12 month data are now available. Vaccine safety was assessed by monitoring for and comparing local reactions, systemic events, medically attended adverse events, serious adverse events, and newly diagnosed chronic medical conditions. Local reactions, which include pain, redness, and swelling, were compared using the pentavalent vaccine and the MIN-B vaccine because the latter is usually more reactogenic than the MIN-ACWI vaccine. A slightly higher percentage of participants had a local reaction to the pentavalent vaccine for both first and second doses than the MIN-B vaccine. The percentage of systemic events were similar between the pentavalent vaccine and the min acdy min b comparison. The percentage varied slightly between groups by systemic event and by dose, with the comparison group having slightly more systemic events after dose one and the pentavalent group having slightly more after dose two. Medically attended adverse events had similar percentages between the study groups, both were less than 15%. More serious adverse events were reported for the pentavalent group, 0.4% versus 0%, but none were assessed to be related to the pentavalent vaccine. For example, as we heard, hospitalization due to other medical conditions. More newly diagnosed chronic um, medical conditions were reported for the pentavalent vaccine, 1.1% versus 0.3%. Pfizer staff just explained that a higher number of participants with attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder were in the pentavalent group and most had related symptoms before entering the study. Of note, higher risk patients were not included in the trials. The following standards were used for assessing immunogenicity for C-groups A, C, W, and Y, and for C-group B. Note the former is after one dose and after two doses, while the latter is after two doses only. For C-groups A, C, W, and Y, one dose of the pentavalent vaccine is non-inferior to one dose of MIN-ACWY in both ACWY naive and prime participants one month after administration. 
and two doses of pentavalent given six months apart are non-inferior to one dose of mini-CWI in both naive and prime participants one month after administration. For persistence of immunity after two doses, data are available out to four years. Zero so protection persists, persists for that time period in both vaccine naive, excuse me, in vaccine naive participants. So your protection also persists for up to four years in prime participants. This is also after a two-dose series of pentavalent vaccine compared to one dose of MNACWI vaccine. For serial group B, two doses of pentavalent vaccine given six months apart are non-inferior to two doses of MNB and naive participants. Primed were not assessed. Waning of immunity for the pentavalent vaccine is very similar to that observed with MIMB, dropping substantially by 12 months post dose two. The work group noted that data were not presented on a three dose schedule pentavalent vaccine. However, a three dose schedule of Trememba is currently recommended for certain high risk groups, for example, people affected by a group B outbreak. Data were also not available in people older than 25 years. This is the same as MIMB vaccines, which are licensed 10 through 25 years. Many ACWI vaccines are licensed up to 55 years and older, depending on the vaccine. Based on the clinical trials data presented, Pfizer's MIN ABCWI vaccine appears non inferior to the MIN ACWI MIMB comparison. There are some data gaps at this point, however, as noted here and on the previous slide. In terms of next steps, the work group will be reviewing additional immunologic persistence data for a single dose of pentavalent vaccine. After that, the work group will turn to grade and ETR. The ACAP secretariat determined that only pentavalent vaccine studies need to be reviewed, not studies covering the component vaccines. A cost effectiveness study also will be conducted. Thanks for listening. Thank you. This presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Lair. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, as a member of the work group, I would appreciate any feedback from the other members of the ACIP on information you would like to have that we could look into so you could make your decision in, um, in two meetings. So if there's anyone has comments on that, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Dr. Cotton. As an adult provider, I would find this a really challenging situation. It would mean that we would need numerous um, meningococcal vaccines stocked in clinic, and that seems uh, a bit overwhelming. So as soon as we could get more adult data, and especially immunocompromised host data, um, including those who get ecolizumab, that would be very, very helpful. I think there's going to be a big gap for years that will be onerous for us in, in clinic. Thank you. And I would also just like to second the question about cost, because I, I'm curious about that. Thank you. And Ms. McNally? I'm just curious about the men B vaccination and wondering if the preferred age would change based on this for primed adolescents. So thank you for the um, common question. Uh, at this point, we're going to focus on the review of the pentavalent vaccines and then turn to the uh, schedule itself uh, afterwards, probably the beginning of, of January or of 2024. And um, to add to that, the reason is we're seeing a change in the epidemiology of meningococcus. And so understanding what's going to happen post-pandemic so that there could be data to drive the decisions, because you're right, this, is, this makes a huge impact on how you interpret this data, and we appreciate that a lot. Dr. Daly. Yeah, so um, sort of Dr. Laird answered your question about what other questions we would have. I, I, I think I didn't appreciate that this was this platform was based in part on an ACWI vaccine that wasn't currently licensed in the US. And so I just want to know, can you walk us through kind of how much inference we're making because of that? Meaning, you know, what's the experience with that vaccine in Europe? And um, 
is it a fair inference to, to take the immunogenicity data that we have here and infer that we're gonna have disease protection across all five sera groups? I mean, I, I don't think that's an unreasonable, but I just wanna know what are we inferring from what data? Thank you. Thank you, and just to extend that, just to clarify, can somebody just remind me what the age group is um, and the recommendations in Europe and how that differs from the US? It's fine to do it at the next meeting. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, this is Dr. Lucy McNamara. I'm the lead for the bacterial meningitis epidemiology team at CDC. Um, so we can certainly pull together additional data on you know the exact uh, age groups where Nimenrex is used in different areas of Europe. I don't think it's the same in every country, but I will say that the vaccine has been used in Europe and other countries for many years very extensively, and there's a wealth of immunogenicity data related to that vaccine. Dr. Paling? Yeah, and as I think about that, I think this is a great point. We should also pay close attention to what's the data in sickle cell and any potential depth um, data on sickle cell or high-risk conditions, splenectomy for whatever reason. Dr. Daly. So, so this, is, this is sort of more of a, a, a broad reflection and just something I don't understand, which is for diseases that are particularly s severe in particular populations, which is true for many diseases, but it seems like for encapsulated organisms or for things like meninge in particular, what is the, what's a reasonable expectation on sponsors, on vaccine manufacturers about when they will study those populations and how much, again, it's sort of this question about <clears throat> if there's a particularly vulnerable population, shouldn't that be a study and that study be quickly following the, the sort of healthy adult sort of study, you know, I, I don't, uh, you know, or, or is the idea that if it's sort of safe and effective in <clears throat> healthy adults, we can just infer something about these particularly vulnerable populations. You know, I, I guess I'm surprised to find that there's not studies planned in particularly vulnerable populations, recognizing that it's hard to do over. Oh. Thank you. I'm going to let Dr. Cotton respond, then Dr. Long, and then Dr. Talbot. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Along those lines, I was wondering, in looking at the epidemiologic data, there's actually a good number of cases in people over the age of 85 um, for whom I don't know that there's any approved meningococcal vaccine. Can you also elaborate? I don't see data that was presented as far as the epidemiology. How many of the adult and or pediatric cases involved immunocompromised or splenectomized or chemically splenectomized um, with ecolizumab. Do you, know, do you have any of that information? Because that would, that would be helpful. I very much agree with Dr. Daly that we need to protect this very vulnerable population. I don't have exact numbers, um, but a lot of the cases in older adults do have some underlying conditions, not necessarily um, ace plenty or, or those specific conditions, but they do have some sort of underlying conditions for the most part. So in all, all three of the many CWI vaccines are available in that age group. Two are off-label, and then Minquad fee is actually, actually licensed for that age. Um, because, so we actually have three remaining questions. We're going to do uh, quick rapid fire questions and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, so Dr. Long. Just to follow up on Dr. Lair's point about um, extreme uh, rarity of this disease and um, prevention strategies currently for most vaccines have public health and the population in mind. And this is not likely to be that decision. It's likely to be to protect a very few individuals. So I think that will be a big consideration as far as cost and longevity of the response um, in trading down to potentially 11 to 12 years. The B response certainly would not be lasting to the time at which we think young people are most susceptible to the rare event of B. So those logistical considerations. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. 
thank you. Um, I'm trying to see how this would fit into the current schedule. So, um, first of all, just to preface that I'm not sure we need an 11 to 12 year old meningococcal vaccine. But regardless of that, um, this, this would be two doses then at 11 to 12 years of age, although it seems like one dose is probably, does provide sufficient immunogenicity except for zero group B. So then it would be, so if we give it at 11, the next one would be 16 to 17, which hasn't been studied beyond four years of age. And so then it would be a second dose then or a third dose. So I'm, I'm, I'm having a little bit of time trying to see how this would fit into a schedule. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Did you want to add anything, Dr. Crow? Uh, so right now we are looking to see the answer to that exact question, and so our, that's our first uh, um, uh, PICO, and then the other two deal with what happens if you only want to use it for MIMB or only want to use it for mini CWI. So one dose of Pinto could be at 11 to 12, and then it could fit in also at the 16. Um, so what it would amount to is, is if you were to get ACWI and MIMB, uh, there would be one fewer dose. You would just get two two doses in that 16 to 18 year range. That's just in theory at this point. Obviously, this is a discussion for the work group and then also deliberation for you and the other ACAP members. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Talbot, last question. Yeah, this is um, brief and this is, I greatly appreciate our pharmaceutical com uh, counterparts because they produce these amazing vaccines that help us save lives. Um, but it's really difficult to continue to test vaccines in the populations that don't need them the most. Um, and so if we need data in those over 85, we should be testing in adults over 85, if that's where the need is. And the second part is, and this is not just for the presentation today, but for all presentations, we need to know how much the vaccine's gonna cost. None of us would go buy a vaccine and go buy a car and not know how much the car is. Um, and so it really is time that a, vac a vaccine price is decided upon and is public and we can actually do true economic models that we know are true because that's going to be the price. So thank you. Thank you. And we will move on to the next session, which is, I'm sorry for the abrupt transition. <laughs> We're going to move on to um, the polio session. And I have Dr. Oliver Brooks, who will provide an introduction and overview as work group chair of the polio vaccine work group. Carol, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. So this is presentation of the uh, ACP polio vaccine work group. This will be the first presentation here to the ACIP. Uh, as you know, the work group was formed because of the one case, which is considered an outbreak in New York City. So we had to determine what specifically would we review regarding polio as it relates to the fact that we now have had a case of paralytic polio. So the terms of reference are the guidance in terms of that which we will be reviewing. Uh, today, we'll be looking at bullet point number one. That being stated, in terms of reference that we now have determined are, number one, whether more specific guidance on adult vaccination, including the use of adult booster doses, uh, can be provided in the context of now circulating polio virus. And number two, whether adults who are immunocompromised should be recommended an additional adult booster of a polio-containing vaccine. Um, number three, whether the fractionated doses of IPV or FIPV as pre-qualified by the WHO to meet the polio vaccine requirements, including for people immigrating to the U.S. And then lastly, consider um, the criteria under which a no novel or a polio vaccine type 2 or NOPV2 might be used in areas with outbreaks or persistent circulation of polio virus. So I will turn it over to Dr. Sarah Kidd for the more specific discussion regarding where we are now in terms of the work group with an adult polio vaccination perspective. Thank you. Thank you, and Dr. Kidd, the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning. Today I'll be presenting on behalf of the Polio Vaccination Work Group. 
Um, as Dr. Brooks mentioned, the work group was established in October last year, and Dr. Kathleen Dooling presented some background and the work group terms of reference to you at the last ACIP meeting in October. Today, I'd like to briefly summarize the, our work group deliberations on adult polio vaccination to date and present some proposed language for adult polio vaccination recommendations in anticipation of an ACIP vote at the June meeting. We'd also like to solicit your feedback and identify areas where more data are needed prior to an ACIP vote. As background, the most recent ACIP statement on adult polio vaccination was published in 2000, and it contains some ambiguous and outdated language. It's, the 2000 statement states that vaccination is recommended for certain adults who are at greater risk for exposure to polio viruses than the general population. Unvaccinated adults who are at increased risk should receive a primary vaccination series with IPV, and adults who have had a primary series of OPV or IPV already and who are at increased risk can receive another dose of IPV. Multiple problems and questions with the recommendations came to light last year when the New York poliomyelitis case was identified. First, the 2000 statement focused almost exclusively on adults who are at increased risk of exposure to poliovirus, and it was unclear how, to, how increased risk should be defined in the setting of circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus in the United States. In addition, the recommendations for unvaccinated adults who were not considered to be at increased risk of exposure were unclear, and the recommendation for vaccinated adults and when or if a booster was advised was also unclear. So the first policy question the work group addressed was, should completion of a primary polio vaccination series with IPV be recommended for unvaccinated and incompletely vaccinated adults in the US? To be more precise, the population being considered was unvaccinated and incompletely vaccinated US adults over the age of 18 years. The intervention is complete completion of a primary vaccination series with IPV the comparison group would be adults with no vaccination or partial series completion. And the most important outcomes of interest are prevention of paralytic polio, serologic immunity to polioviruses types 1, 2, and 3, serious adverse events following a vaccination, and also indirect effects such as community transmission and impact on health systems. And just to keep in mind the, definition, the current definition of fully vaccinated, an adult is considered fully vaccinated if they received a primary series of at least three doses of trivalent OPV or IPV in any combination administered at least four weeks apart, and the last dose in the series was given on or after the fourth birthday, and the last dose in the series was given at least six months after the previous dose. So as this group knows, poliovirus infection can cause poliomyelitis and lifelong paralysis. But paralytic disease occurs in fewer than 1% of infections, with the exact frequency varying by serotype. Most poliovirus infections are asymptomatic. The incidence of paralytic polio decreased rapidly in the United States after introduction of the Salk inactivated polio vaccine, quickly followed by the Sabin oral polio vaccine. Sabin vaccine was used for routine childhood immunization in the US for decades. In 1997, an enhanced potency IPV was introduced as part of a sequential schedule with OPV. And in 2000, the US moved to an IPV only schedule. IPV has been the only polio vaccine recommended in the US since that time. Wild poliovirus type 1 and vaccine-derived poliovirus types 1 through 3 still circulate in certain parts of the world. This figure shows the distribution of paralytic polio cases in the last 12 months. Cases of wild poliovirus type 1 are shown in red, vaccine-derived poliovirus type 1 in gold, vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2 in green, and vaccine-derived poliovirus type 3 in purple. Approximately 650 paralytic cases have been identified globally in the last 12 months. 
And then as you are aware, a case of paralytic polio caused by vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2 was confirmed in an unvaccinated young adult from Rockland County, New York on July 21st, 2022. Genetic sequencing has indicated a linkage of the virus from this case to poliovirus's collected in wastewater in Israel, the United Kingdom, and now Canada. Of note, Rockland County has reported overall low vaccine coverage for over 20 years, and in the summer of 2022, 60% of children under two years of age had received the recommended three doses of IPV. However, zip code level coverage was as low as 37% in some areas. Poliovirus related to the case was detected in wastewater in Rockland and several other New York counties and in New York City. Retrospective testing detected poliovirus in the area as early as April 2022, and the most recent positive sample was collected on December 15th. Samples collected in the last seven to eight weeks have all been negative, and again, no additional paralytic polio cases have been identified. So there are no reliable data on vaccination coverage for people who are currently adults in 2023. So the best estimate of adults who are protected against paralytic polio comes from Ciro surveys. Ciro surveys indicate that a large majority of Americans have protective antibodies to polio virus. In this in survey that was conducted in 2009 to 2010, Ciro prevalence varied by polio virus serotype, but was high in all the age groups studied. Zero prevalence for type 3 was consistently the lowest, but remained high even in the oldest age group studied. The effectiveness of enhanced potency IPV has been established. The presence of detectable neutralizing antibody is an accepted correlative protection against paralytic disease. However, immunity against paralytic disease may be present even in the absence of detectable antibodies. Studies of the serologic immunogenicity among infants and children show that 70 to 100 percent are seropositive after two doses, and 88 to 100 percent are seropositive after three doses. There are limited data on the vaccine effectiveness of the current IPV formulation, but estimates range from 36 to 89 percent for one dose and 89 to 98 percent for two doses. Not surprisingly, because this is a routine childhood vaccine, there is a paucity of data for adults who receive a primary series. In addition to serologic immunity, which protects against severe disease and paralysis, it's also important to consider mucosal immunity and the potential effect of IPV on transmission. IPV does not decrease the proportion of people who will shed poliovirus when exposed. Multiple studies have shown that there's no significant difference between IPV and unvaccinated individuals in terms of the odds of shedding from the intestines. However, IPV vaccination does appear to reduce the quantity and perhaps the duration of shedding, although a recent modeling study indicated no impact of IPV on the duration of shedding. There are fewer data on nasopharyngeal immunity following IPV vaccination, but data from two studies suggests that rates of nasopharyngeal shedding are similar and low among both OPV and IPV vaccinees. In terms of safety, the safety of IPV is also well established and IPV is well tolerated. Local reactions at the injection site were reported during trials and up to a third report erythema in duration or tenderness at the injection site. Combining IPV with other vaccines has not been associated with increased frequency or severity of reported adverse reactions compared to when the other vaccines are administered alone, and no severe events have been causally associated with the use of the current formulation of IPV. In a paper that looked at 2000 to 2012 data from the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, during a period when more than 250 million IPV-containing vaccine doses were distributed, 41,792 adverse events reports were submitted for IPV-containing vaccines. The majority of these were for non-serious events, and not surprisingly, 95% were among persons under seven years of age. 
Most events were associated with IPV co-administered with other vaccines, and standalone IPV accounted for just 0.5% of reports. It's important to remember that VAERS is a passive reporting system and can't assess causal associations between vaccination and adverse events. But reported adverse events were similar and proportional to those purport reported for other vaccines. Most of the work group deliberations were focused on whether the recommendation for unvaccinated adults should be a risk-based recommendation or a uniform recommendation for all unvaccinated adults. Currently, situations that are con considered to put adults at increased risk of poliovirus exposure include international travelers, laboratory and healthcare workers, and healthcare workers or other caregivers. In addition, unvaccinated or incompletely vaccinated adults whose children will be receiving an oral polio vaccine, and unvaccinated or incompletely vaccinated adults who are living or working in a community where polio virus is circulating are considered to be at increased risk of exposure. During these deliberations, it became clear that there was a difference and that most of these situations posed risk at the individual level, and there would be an opportunity to anticipate the risk and vaccinate prior to the potential exposure. But this last situation for unvaccinated and incompletely vaccinated adults in a community where poliovirus was circulating is a bit different. And in this situation, this situation affects an entire population and the community is already at increased risk at the time the risk is recognized. This means there would potentially be missed opportunities for vaccination prior to exposure if the recommendation remained a risk-based recommendation. When considering the pros and cons of a uniform versus a risk-based recommendation, the pros of a uniform recommendation are that it allows unvaccinated adults and their healthcare providers to take advantage of opportunities to get vaccinated before they are at increased risk of exposure. And it brings adult polio vaccination policy closer in line with other routine childhood vaccines, for instance, MMR and varicella vaccines. It's also less, a less complicated policy to communicate and understand in that a recommendation of who is at increased risk isn't changing based on the latest wastewater data. The cons of a uniform recommendation are that most adults in the United States have a very low risk of poliovirus exposure and periolytic polio, and most adults already received primary polio vaccination series as children. In addition, Demand for IPV could potentially exceed supply, particularly if a large number of adults without documentation of polio vaccination status were to assume they were not vaccinated. However, this issue could be mitigated by providing guidance for this group in the clinical considerations. Ultimately, the majority of the work group felt the, believed the pros of uniform recommendation outweigh the cons and support a uniform recommendation. However, a substantial minority, about one third of the work group, favor maintaining a risk-based recommendation. For the majority uh, recommendation proposed language, the language would uh, be as follows. Adults who are known or suspected to be unvaccinated or incompletely vaccinated against polio should complete a primary vaccination series with IPV. And then the clinical considerations would have a statement along the lines of the following. In general, unless there are specific reasons to believe they were not vaccinated, most adults who are born and raised in the United States can assume they were vaccinated against polio as children. Moving on now to our second policy question. The second policy question addressed by the work group is, should a booster IPV dose be recommended for adults in the US who have previously completed a primary polio vaccination series? Again, the population being uh, assessed are US adults aged over 18 years who have completed a primary polio vaccination series with trivalent OPV, IPV, or a combination of both. The intervention would be booster, a booster dose of IPV, and the comparison group would be adults who completed a primary series but did not receive a booster dose. Again, the outcomes are the same as for the previous policy question, um, prevention of paralytic polio, serologic immunity to poliovirus types one, two, and three, serious adverse events following vaccination, and then also indirect effects such as community transmission and impact on health system. 
The current recommendation regarding adult boosters is that adults who have had a primary series of OPV or IPV and who, and who are at increased risk can receive another dose of IPV. Available data do not indicate the need for more than a single lifetime booster dose with IPV for adults. This has been a long-standing recommendation since trivalent OPV was used in routine immunization. However, the actual need for a supplementary dose has not been established, but it was thought that there is value in assuring protection against infection with wild polioviruses when exposure can reasonably be expected. Of note, at least uh, two, there have been at least two reported cases of paralytic polio in adult travelers who have completed a primary series with either SALK IPV or trivalent OPV. However, further details on these cases are not available, and it's not clear whether a booster dose would have prevented these cases. It's unclear whether previous vaccinated, previously vaccinated adults need an IPV booster for protection. Showed here again are the results of the NHANE sero survey showing that the seroprevalence of neutralizing antibodies is high for all three serotypes in all the age groups studied. There are no data on the comparative vaccine effectiveness of a primary series plus booster compared to a primary series only. But serologic studies in adults with heterogeneous pre-booster vaccination histories and heterogeneous seropositivity have shown that 98 to 100% were seropositive one month after receiving an IPV-containing booster. One study also followed up trial participants 10 years later, and 98 to 100% were still positive at that time for those who followed up. So the majority of the work group agree with the current recommendation for adult IPV boosters. This recommendation is risk-based and is based on shared clinical decision-making. The proposed language includes some slight edits to modernize the language, uh, namely substituting the word may for can from the previous, from the 2000 statement. And it would read, adults who have received a primary series of trivalent OPV or IPV in any combination and who are at increased risk of poliovirus exposure may receive another dose of IPV. Available data do not indicate the need for more than a single lifetime booster dose with IPV for adults. I'd like to thank the members of the polio work group. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. And this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Cotton. Thank you very much for the uh, excellent presentation. I see a lot of immunocompromised people who are traveling abroad, including many people in their 60s and 70s. And I'm wondering about this recommendation for a single lifetime booster. Say they had the booster 20 or 30 years ago, and they are immunocompromised. It does seem like a population that might be more vulnerable. So I'm wondering if there's any thoughts about leeway there, or um, I don't believe that there's robust data, but I do, I do wonder whether a single additional lifetime dose is adequate in that population. Thank you. The work group is planning on um, addressing immunocompromised persons next in the next few months. So we will look at that. Dr. Lair. Um, I'm, thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering about, does anyone have the historical reference of what the recommendations were in the 1950s and 1960s? So for example, if someone was born in 1940, who would now be 83 years old, they would have been 15 um, when it came out, and they would have been 21 when the SOC vaccine came out. And would they have gotten a rec routine recommendation to get it as a teenager? Is there an age where we would say they probably didn't get it because they were already an adult? Thank you. So the question is, is there, because they were, because they were older, yeah. So the, um, the Salk campaigns did target uh, adults up to I want to say I want to say 20 or 30. Um, so it was uh, at least young adults. Uh, the coverage is not 100 percent for those. Uh, however, for we do have data for estimated coverage for people born 
1950 and later. Um, I think when you get to that age group, the seroprevalence studies data is actually better than coverage. Uh, I think the, the coverage data is a little bit, can be an underestimate. So the seroprevalence data indicate that a higher percent are actually protected. Now that could be um, from primary immunization. It also could be uh, from secondary immunization from exposure to somebody who received OPV. Um, but the seroprevalence data indicate, you know, again, high, co uh, high protection, levels of protection in terms of neutralizing antibodies. Um, we do have some Salk vaccination coverage data for what that's worth for people who were um, uh, even, you know, ch children and adults during that, uh, and that would indicate coverage of maximum, you know, 50 to 60 percent in young adults, but so it wasn't 100 percent at that time. Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. Um, my concern is that I I think a lot of adults have no idea if they were vaccinated or not. And I think that's going to have to be clearly stated in the clinical considerations as to, I don't know if there's a specific year after which they can be considered um, um, protected. I just, I just do not believe, and even within my own family, I. A lot of people do not know if they've been vaccinated against polio when you ask them. And most of the time, you just assume they, they have been. So I think that's going to have to be a, um, very well detailed. Thank you. We agree, and that's why I think that clinical consideration statement is, is so important to be reassuring, especially to the worried well. I think it's, it is important to recognize that um, adults, you know, the person who had um, paralytic polio in New York was a young adult who knew they were unvaccinated. So there are definitely um, groups of young adults, you know, <laughs> who were born, you know, 2000 and, uh, and later, those are adults now, um, that are aware they were unvaccinated or have reason to believe they're unvaccinated. Um, so I think those would be the target groups. We want to be re generally reassuring to the majority of Americans. Thank you. Dr. Sineas. Thank you. To follow up on Dr. Sanchez's uh, comment, uh, in my practice, I also see a lot of patients who were not born in the United States, who do not have vaccine records, or who are refugee patients. So we will need uh, clear guidance as to what to do uh, with those patients, whether it would be to um, do a primary series uh, versus a one-time booster. Uh, so hopefully there will be um, clear guidance on that as well. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Dr. Sineas asked my question. Thank you. Dr. Chen. I, I have a very niche question, which is, um, as a travel medicine physician, we oftentimes have to uh, provide proof of polio booster for international travel, and it has to be on that uh, ICVP uh, form or, or certificate. Um, will the adult booster uh, qualify, and if I, as a physician, see that they've gotten their adult booster, uh, polio booster, don't have the lot number or those sorts of things to put on the form, how do I comply with that uh, international standard to not facilitate that person's travel? Do I then have to maybe give another booster dose? Because again, I don't have access to that information. This is a very niche question, so it's not going to apply to everyone at all, but uh, just I trying think, to work through the logistics. I think you might be referring to is certain countries may have entry or departure requirements. Yes. And uh, uh, yeah, I think so that's a separate question um, versus I, I'm not aware of countries actually. Yeah, I'd be interested in talking to you afterwards about what countries are actually um, requiring that. Uh, there is some interplay with um, Right, with what other potential, and, and so of course, it, there might be a need for another booster, depending if they're going to a country, and you don't want them to be detained before departure. Um, so yeah, that would be another reason for another IPV booster dose. Dr. Lair? Um, another slightly niche question. I don't know immigration rules for vaccines. I know some vaccines are required if you immigrate to the United States. I don't know if polio is on that list. I'm just sort of curious if anyone knows that, because that would be information. If they, if they immigrated, could, did they have to prove that they had polio before they immigrated? Those kinds of questions. Dr. Ruth, if you're on the line, could you speak to the specifics of that? 
Uh, sure. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, there are different populations of people who do emigrate to the United States. Uh, we've, we've got people on uh, visitors' visas. We also have people coming in through refugee programs. Um, definitely on the refugee program side, um, before they enter the United States, the, um, both adults and children are required to have certain immunizations. And those immunizations are given outside the country before they enter the United States. For people coming in on visitors, visas, et cetera, they are not required to show proof of polio vaccination to enter the United States. Thank you. It sounds like clarification of some of these questions would be helpful perhaps next time, just uh, for the clinical considerations component. Um, Dr. Bell? Thank you. Um, could I ask you to please put up again the proposed uh, wording for the um, for the for your first policy question for uh, all adults? Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think I appreciate, I guess, you know, my point here is um, I appreciate the interest of the work group in, in making things simpler and that sometimes, you know, risk groups um, are, are, can be considered to be less simple, but I, I guess, you know, I have a little bit of a, um, lack of enthusiasm for um, the majority recommendation here in that I suspect myself, as people have said, that people won't know if they're unvaccinated or inc incompletely vaccinated, except for some subgroups who perhaps know that they're unvaccinated um, because um, they chose not to be vaccinated. And then some of the populations of uh, immigrants that people are talking about. And so I guess I'm not really sure whether um, uh, making a recommendation like this is actually simpler or just adding an additional risk group. Um, and uh, I don't know whether the work group is, is planning to not in include the previous um, populations that are recommended for vaccination or that this would be like an additional uh, an additional recommendation in addition to the existing recommendations. Thanks, Dr. Bell. I think this would be a um, substitute for the current risk-based recommendation. And I think the, the current language uh, has, was confusing prior to this case um, in that we learned that many people were interpreting that as you have an unvaccinated adult in front of you who says, should I be vaccinated for polio? And they were being declined, saying you don't need vaccination. Um, and uh, I think we're uncomfortable with that. And also knowing that, again, there's these pockets of young adults who are unvaccinated and to turn on a risk-based recommendation when there's introduction into the community, you're already behind the game uh, and trying to do a lot of work to, to convince uh, people of the need for vaccination, whereas you potentially have lost time there um, if, if to, to provide and offer vaccination to that group. These are exactly the themes that the work group has been struggling with, so um, I don't disagree with your, your perception. Thank right. you. Uh, can I just ask one little follow-up question? Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, so let's say there's somebody who's... Um, a new laboratory worker um, who was going to be working with polio virus. Um, so the idea with a recommendation like this would be that the occupational health people would know that, you know, they would still have a policy about asking about polio vaccination. Uh, they would think about the general vaccine, the general recommendation we've got here, and they would, and this would still con continue to be part of their protocol. Same for the other uh, risk groups for which, um, polio vaccination is currently recommended. Is that essentially the thinking about how those previous recommendations would, you know, continue? Or is the work group thinking that those, those populations don't need vaccination anymore? 
I think certainly those would still be considered, that a lab worker would still be considered a person at increased risk of poliovirus exposure. So that would be called out in consideration for a, a booster as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Romero? If I could offer a comment on that, as someone who worked in a polio lab, um, it was, and it still is, and, and many friends that I have that work with polio, um, it's a requirement of anybody going into the lab to have a booster because they're working with high titered wild type virus. Thank you. And I, I'm assuming that is what the proposed language for recommendation two is, which is around the booster and risk-based recommendations. Right. There's a difference between general laboratory workers and work laboratory workers working in a poliovirus laboratory. Yeah. Um, Thank yeah. you. Dr. Talbot? Yeah. I wanted to touch base on an earlier comment. These were people who decided not to be vaccinated, yes, but actually they were children and their parents decided not to vaccinate them. Um, and Many times we grow up and follow our parents' footsteps, and many times we don't. And so this gives physicians a way to get these now adults who've decided to be vaccinated caught up. And so I think it's a great opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Zahn? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I guess I just say I, I, I think I have the same sort of concerns that Dr. Bell was raising. I, um, can I ask, uh, it sounds like this is a recommendation that has been more or less made in the New York communities where the case was identified, any sense of how that played out in New York, uh, the update uptake of vaccination in the adult population, and I could it could be really hard to tell, but how many people were getting vaccinated who were known not to be vaccinated versus persons who you were just really being vigilant and may have been vaccinated before and just decided to get another vaccine just because they weren't sure. Any experience from New York that could illuminate how this may play out nationally? We can try and get some more specific numbers for you. I do know that in New York City, when they did, um, uh, you know, they did expand saying that all unvaccinated adults should uh, be vaccinated in New York City. They were, was not a rush on adult <laughs> IPV doses, that it was a manageable amount. So um, there is a, yeah, there is an open question of how much um, public health messaging will create a demand or not. Okay. And, and just to make sure, I'm sorry, just that same question, to make sure. So if someone calls the health department after this recommendation of their provider and says, I don't know if I've received the vaccine before or not, I'm no particular risk, should I get vaccinated or not? Is the recommendation yes or no, or you kid if you want to? Um, well, I, that's kind of the dilemma of the current recommendation. <laughs> the current language <laughs> well, is that uh, yeah. there's not a clear answer to that question. Certainly, if they were in, considered at increased risk of exposure, the recommendation is clearly sure. yes, get vaccinated. Uh, and then there's no statement on what to do with an unvaccinated person. On our website, uh, sorry, unvaccinated person not considered at increased risk. On our website, we have um, said, those those persons should discuss with their doctor their their risk and likelihood of not that they hadn't been vaccinated, um, but that's that's one of the reasons why we wanted to clarify this language and update this language. Thank you. Okay. I guess I'd comment. I, I'm, it's not totally clear to me what guidance I would give based on this if someone called up, but but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds like there's lots of opportunity for our clinical considerations to provide this kind of guidance. I will, just one last thing, and then we'll, we'll um, close this up, which is, uh, you know, thinking back to the comments made at the very beginning of today's session, uh, I do think equity and access is going to be an issue here because um, it, it, understanding first the proportion or the numbers of people who are un or under vaccinated would be really important. It's going to be a challenge to get those numbers exact. But on the other hand, um, it's really also important for us to be able to offer reasonable access to individuals who may want vaccines who are unvaccinated or under vaccinated. And, um, you know, if these individuals don't have medical homes, if these individuals don't have insurance coverage, you know, thinking about our responsibility uh, to those individuals and making sure that they have the ability to get covered through a vaccines for adults program or something along those lines. Otherwise, it rests on um, our public health colleagues to just fill in the gaps um, or for there to be an outbreak for us to fill in the gap. So it's just, it's a really challenging situation, but not one I realize you can solve alone. I uh, <laughs> just wanted to raise that issue. Thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll um, adjourn until 20 minutes after the hour. Thank you, everyone.